Ching Siu Lee. Uh, you present Alert Brokers for ZTF and LSSP time domain. So hello everyone. So my name is Jen Xiu. I'm from NOAO. So I'm not part of the PPP survey yet. I hope I can. So <laughs> today I just want to convince you that for the for the recent future that the time domain will be very important. So for that reason, we are building a broker for the LST and then the user pay can be a very important part to answer this purpose. So let me start with uh, this uh, few, uh, this collection of the uh, ultra wide field cameras. So in the past decade, we are really pleased to have several uh, um, large area optical surveys coupled with this ultra wide field um, cameras. Uh, it's a place, but it's also a curse because right now, for the for the current largest surveys from the Swiggy Transient Facility, it has a field field of forty seven square degrees. That means you are going to have a hundred thousands of alerts per night, and then you want to pick you know several of them to follow up. It's really like a haystack in the needle. Sorry, a needle in a haystack. Try to find it. <laughs> and in the near future, ST will deliver 10 million of them, which is really, really difficult if you only have so much resource to follow them. Uh, to make it more complicated, you are, you know, uh, presented with so many possibilities. We don't know which one is the likely explanation for each of the alerts. And we are looking for the rarest of the rare, which could be, you know, with a time scale of up to several days. And then you really want to observe them as early as possible. You don't want to miss them. So here is the solution we come up with. So if you are trading with like stock, you're probably familiar with the idea of brokers. Uh, you don't want to, you know monitor each of the stack you have, and then you just want to know which one is the most promising one. So here's the same thing for the alerts. So in the future, we'll have different um, surveys. LST, for example, is one of them. There are so many alerts, and you don't want to deal with each of them. So you have these brokers, we call alert brokers. So here I just put in uh, Antares as one example, but it can be substituted with other ones. Uh, so the other brokers uh, will take the alerts generated from all those surveys. Not only in Africa, it can be LIGO or it can be neutrino uh, telescopes. Uh, then we'll calculate alerts uh, using either the light curve or other contextual information like cross matching with different catalogs. Uh, we'll disrupt them to introduce parties, and we can also be uh, interfacing with target and observation managers, which is here we call it, uh, the TAMS. So the TAMS is like you feed them the target layers, <laughs> the crosstalk with the telescope, and then you can follow up them immediately. So in the end, what we try to do is to um, have an end to end uh, follow up network with as minimum human interaction as possible. So let's take a look of what Antares or uh, in general what a broker will do. So here in the middle, you will see uh, on the top is LST. It will give you uh, um, 10 million alerts per night. You will put them into our system. So you try to associate them with previous alerts. So to make light curve, you try to associate them with different catalog to have multi wavelength uh, properties. Then you try to extract some features from those. Uh, and here you see on the left hand side is a touchstone. It is kind of a database where you possess the previous information of different kinds of objects. <coughs> the variables could be transient like supernova. You just try to compare the feature with it, and then you can have an idea roughly is this variable or transient or a moving object. Then you do some filtering. For example, if you have like only a two meter telescope to do follow up, you don't want to have two thin targets. So we can say, okay, I want to provide target only or such kind of filters. At the end, what we try to come up is like a hundred of alerts, <laughs> which will call in the rest of the rare, which will deserve follow up. So uh, now we don't have LST in hand, but we have a three key transit factory. So we try to build this kind of system. And this kind of brokers, they must be science oriented. So uh, it must be driven by certain science. <laughs> For example, if you are familiar with like supernova cosmology, and if you have a lot of a task plan, usually in classical mode, then you don't want alert every night, but you want alert on the nights where you are observing. So in principle, we can just go to our system and say, okay, well, I'm going to observe 
uh, tomorrow or maybe you know in a month and you give me some fresh alerts within the past few nights then you can observe them so this is called fancy on demand <laughs> or if you are interested in tidal disrupting events which are very close to the center of galaxies that could be uh, caused by accretion of style objects by the black hole and the game player then you can say, okay, find me a lot which are very close to the center of galaxies. Or if you are working on a moving object or the um, solar system objects. So for now, there are several kind of objects. You can discover new comments for sure, but you can also do something um, like long-term monitoring of those <laughs> objects and comments. Some of them, they'll do periodic outbursts and some of the asteroids, they will suddenly become a comet, which we call them active asteroids. Want to know what's caused their hours? You can do this um, by checking <laughs> the alerts associated. The, so this one is a little bit difficult because they are not happening on the same location uh, on the sky. So you need to go back. But if you know the orbital elements, you can go back, trace back all those alerts and try to monitor the photometric variations. So for those, we are now uh, actively streaming out the uh, Swiggy transient factor alerts by pre-selecting all those alerts I just mentioned. So we have these extra galactic alerts associated with external galaxies. We also have size signal alerts, which can be observed by smaller telescopes. We also have nuclear transient and also sources and objects. <coughs> but uh, for individual users, they probably don't have, you know, not much telescope time. And they are just interesting a small amount of objects. For that, they can do watch list. So for this one, you can provide us a CSV file, and then you can specify uh, the position of your object and also the searching radius. And the good thing about the watch list is that we are connected to Slack. I believe everyone here are now working with Slack, right? So the good thing about Slack is it can notify you right away. So we are doing this nightly. So even in the middle of night, this will be done automatically. And then once there's a little hit on your target of interest, it will send you an alert and you can just wake up and then do your follow up. <laughs> so you probably will be in the curious test list in the world. Uh, the answer is yes. So for uh, us developers, we are not only interested in doing this infrastructure, we are also interested in science. So this uh, science uh, interest uh, team has been pursued. So the left hand side is a supernova we confirmed with a follow up from the Los Cumbres 2 meter telescope. So we take a spectra with only two telescope, uh, telescopes, and then cover supernova 1A. The middle part is an interesting dot nova super outburst. So we see this from CDF, and then we take H alpha imaging and then convert its super outburst nature. The right hand side is uh, using watch list function from Antares. So we know there are some current uh, recurrent nova in N31, and they can re they can <laughs> reappear after several years. So we have this in the watch list, and then we uh, hunt one, hit one night, and then we immediately trigger a Gemini follow-up. So the right-hand side is the Gemini spectra, shortly before uh, they close due to the protesters. <laughs> so we're very lucky. <laughs> okay, so but we want to do more. It's not just, you know, just simply building out these alerts. So what this kind of system will enable you is uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So as I said before, we are not only taking <laughs> alerts from LST, we can also take alerts from, for example, recognition wave detectors and then try to collect collect them together. Then we can find uh, optical counterparts. So this is what we try to do. We try to connect to the uh, LIGO <coughs> alerts and then we can get a, a map of the uh, of the uh, uh, pass, uh, possible locations of this gravitational wave events, although it's really large. But 3P has a large field field, and in the future, LSD will also have a very large, uh, yet much deeper uh, photometry. Then you can try to find optical counterpart right away. Another thing you want to try to do is to, you know, to use machine learning to classify these kind of alerts. So uh, our colleague from Space Test of Science is still now moving to Illinois, uh, and his uh, student at the University of Cambridge. They are now uh, working on a uh, <coughs> learning classifier called Rapid. So the idea is pretty simple. So you just keep uh, monitoring the alerts when the data comes in. Then you'll see the flux variation. You'll also see the color variation. 
So you can kind of predict what it's going to be. It's just like when you are typing using <laughs> your mobile phone, it will predict, will predict what kind of text you are trying to type. So this is a very similar uh, idea. And in the end, uh, so right now using the Swiki, they are already able to uh, classify some of the title describing events on the right hand side. Um, there's another thing we can do is that you take all the Swiki um, data, the light curves, and then you try to say, okay, so given the uh, the time span, so, so the time between the first and the second measurements, and then you can see the difference in the magnitude, you can also see a difference in the color, then you will have a distribution as the, the change in either the photometry, uh, the brightness, or the color as a function of time. Then you have a distribution, and then you can compare uh, all the new incoming alerts if they belong to a certain distribution, or if not, it could be something which is really uh, up. <coughs> this can be something uh, um, worth to follow up. All right. So just to sum up, so for Antares, uh, it's an open uh, project, so everyone can request to it. So everyone here, if you are interested in doing follow-up with the three frequency factory. So it's always in the northern sky, but it's uh, does cover to minus 30 degree in the declination. So probably uh, uh, overlap a little bit with the southern sky surface. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, we have different uh, output. We have uh, the web portal, so you can go to the web and then click different um, alerts. You can also use Slack channel, get a notification right away. We also have a, um, a kind of API using a Python-based code, so you can page download all your interest uh, alerts and then do more sophisticated analysis. Uh, we also have to keep a separate copy of all those alerts. So when we have alert, we try to associate them so we can get a full light curve. You keep them in a separate copy. So those uh, light curves uh, associated with different catalogs are in our database, and you can do your own query for those. Try to play around with different kind of variables, for example. And we are now trying to communicate with downstream systems like the target observation managers, <laughs> so that you can do follow up right away. So just want to mention because now there are several brokers uh, around the globe. Uh, so when you look at a broker, it's not only what it does to build out all those alerts, but also how does it integrate and embed it in the follow-up system. So for Antares, we are replaced because NLIO is behind us, so we can connect to AST, and then we also have our SaaS platform and NLIO data lab. We also have a network of follow-up, which is called Beyond, and then Gemini is also part of the Beyond network. And then also there's the target observing manage, uh, managers, which is really powerful when you get all those alerts. So you can have end to end automatic follow up network. So up now it's about Antares. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, up to now you might feel a little confused why am I talking about this, right? <laughs> so how does this read to be? So for one, um, so in the RST era, we don't have a much coverage in other filters, in other weapons. So uh, LSD is going to cover in the optical. I also need infrared to do better classification. So that's, that's where I think PPP will play a very important role into that. And on top of that, we are now already trying to have these systems uh, try to understand what kind of variables or transient would be in LST. So as you can see here, um, part of the touchstone is the most important thing. We try to have kind of library of different kinds of varying sources. So for that, PPP can play a very important role, uh, especially have a time resolve of photometry. So right now we are doing this with our own resource. We have a DECAN to take a uh, field in the uh, Galaxy Forge area. So this is done by my colleague, Abby Saha. So they have a DCAM camera observing uh, tens of epochs with six filters from U to C in the optical. And then um, they get very nice uh, extinction map of one of the guide project area. So what I didn't show here is that we got a very nice light up. So this uh, extinction map actually comes from our LIRA. So from our LIRA, you know the color, then you can get extinction map. In principle, that means you, you've got very nice uh, time series photometry. 
So if we can combine those optical ones with the PPP infrared ones, then we can do a lot of things from those um, data type being combined. And personally, I'm also interested in plant-end microlensing. So yesterday, Gabriela probably mentioned a lot about microlensing. So the most interesting one for me, for myself, is plant-end microlensing. So if you are not familiar with plant-end microlensing, the idea is that when you have a microlensing of a star, you'll see the big bump here. But if there's extra plant associated with it, you'll see small spikes here. So by fitting a light curve, you will know the mass ratio between the whole star and the planets. But you don't know the true mass of the planets. So the way we can around to get the true mass of the planets is that we use the flux from the whole stars to infer its mass. So here on the left hand side is an example. So you need very high resolution imagery, for example, the, uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So, and here you can see a plane of the lens and the source here. So if you do a single PSF fitting, you 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 probably do the job. But if you do a dual PSF star, you can resolve both the lens and the source. So if you get a flux from the uh, the lens, which is the whole star, then you can infer the mass and then infer the mass of the exoplanet. But that means you need to be very lucky to resolve them. So sometimes we are not lucky. So what we can do is that we can use the um, the uh, lack of modeling and then predict what is the flux contribution from the uh, from the source and also from the lens. So in principle, when you do this lack of modeling, it means that you simply see the uh, magnification from the source. But actually, when you have a blended uh, system like this, it will be a uh, kind of uh, blended with the uh, lens uh, flux here, but please keep in mind that lens is not actually magnified. So you can see the flux axis from the light curve fitting, and then you can kind of infer what is the flux from the lens. Excuse me. Yes. You can see a, a secondary bump on the right. Yeah. Do you know? <coughs> this one? Yes. This one. Yeah. So it's depending on how does the planet system across the caustic. So mm. if the cross the caustic several times, then you'll see several bumps. Uh, so it's not only one bump, it could be you know two or three bumps. Okay. So so back to where I was. So if you have the flux of the lens, you can infer the uh, the mass of exoplanets. And PVP will provide very good baseline flux in the infrared. So the reason why I call the infrared because it's almost extinction free, right? You can get extinction free colors and that's better than the optical. The last one uh, is to do galaxy structure with <coughs> batteries. So our friend Chris Aminyak, uh, he was at Subaru when he did this with Dante. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> is using the PVD and all go, then using the uh, extreme battery. So the like, idea is that from the binary light curve, you can know the geometry or the relative size of uh, both stars. Then we go to the isochromes and try to select the pairs which can best fit the light curve. And for this, you really need PVP because you can have extinction free color. And especially for the forge and the black plan, it's really extinctive. So that's why you need PVP. So I also did some follow up with other um, data sets like the Kalina sky survey, which is far worse because it's not as deep as, as the OGO and also. You know, we don't have very good uh, infrared, so at there we only have two mass. So PVP will provide much better, and then if we got LSD light curves, then you will do a much better job, and hopefully we can map out the whole the entire structure of them. So I will stop there and take questions. So uh, if you're interested, I can give a demo of Antares maybe in the afternoon. So you can just you know okay. sign up and then I can show you how to do all this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it sounds really wonderful because we, we, we all have lots of favorite objects to, from various studies in the past, which we like to, to watch, you know, these watch lists are yeah, really sure, cool. Yeah, yeah. Sure, of course. Yeah. So right now, it, you can just reach us to Antares. Um, we now temporarily keep a limit of a thousand objects in the watch list. But if you are interested in more, you can define your own filters 
and then you can put in the system and they will do the cross mesh in real time. Mm -hmm. So you can do much more than 1,000, but if it has a small number, you can already use the mesh. Okay. 